Okay, so welcome everyone. Um, this is actually a grad class in the Master of Sustainability program uh, called SAS 5 po 4 Transdisciplinary uh, Sustainability Seminar Series. So we're all set to, um, to start the class. We welcome as well people from the broader Brock University community and also public to this talk by um, Dr. David Fennell. So, um, so welcome everybody. First, I want to acknowledge um, that Brock University acknowledges the land on which we gather is the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe peoples, many of whom continue to live and work here today. This territory is covered by the Upper Canada Treaties and is within the land protected by the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Agreement. Today, this gathering place is home to many First Nations, Métis, and Inuit peoples, and acknowledging reminds us that our great standard of living is directly related to the resources and friendship of Indigenous peoples. Um, it's a gorgeous day here, and some of you are, are joining us from quite a, quite a distance. I can tell you I'm about three minutes away from Brock campus by car, and it's a beautiful, gorgeous day here. 15 degrees Celsius. I wish we could be meeting outside. Um, in any case, here we are. Um, so I wanna give you a little bit of background on our speaker today, David Fennell, researchers, reach, reach, does his research in areas of ecotourism, the moral issues tied to the use of animals in the tourism industry, sustainable tourism, which is of particular interest I know to our students, as well as um, tourism ethics. He has published widely in these areas and in all of the field's top journals and has written several books. Examples include ecotourism, ecotourism program planning, tourism ethics, codes of ethics in tourism, tourism and animal ethics, and a recent book entitled Sustainable Tourism 2020. A major thrust of his research involves the use of theory from other disciplines like biology and um, philosophy to gain traction on many of tourism's most persistent issues and problems. And we know that well here in the context of COVID and, and in the Niagara region, tourism is, is critical to our uh, economy here. Um, Dr. Fennell is a founding editor-in-chief of the Journal of Ecotourism and is an active member of editorial boards of many academic journals. David is the editor of a book series by Rutledge on tourism ethics, as well as an editor um, of two Rutledge handbooks on tourism, Tourism and the Environment and Ecotourism, which is forthcoming. He's an adjunct professor at Auckland University of Technology as well. And at Rock, he's a member of a uh, department I belong to at one time, the Department of Geography and Tourism Studies. So um, it is absolutely my pre pleasure, David, to welcome you to the class today. And I'll pass the floor to you. Thank you very much, Marilyn. Much appreciated. Uh, this, this is uh, really the first presentation I've ever done where I can't actually see anybody. So except, except my screen. Um, Marilyn tells me that you can see me, okay, which which is which is which is great. But uh, I I wish we were certainly in a classroom situation and, and able to interact along those lines a little bit a little bit better. Um, so this the presentation today, the tourism knowledge translation framework bridging the canyon between theory and practice, is one of those um, persistent problems um, that that's taking place in the tourism industry. So. Um, I, uh, I, want, I want to bid you good morning uh, or afternoon or evening, depending on where you are, and uh, I hope all of you are well. Um, so this, this, this research and this paper uh, stems from um, me sitting down in the summer and scratching my head over the COVID-19 situation. And it's really incredible how many papers have, have crept into the, into the journals at this stage of the game over COVID-19. And the journals are doing a great job turning research around uh, quicker than they've they've normally done, and which certainly has relevance to what we'd be talking about today. Um, but the COVID-19 issue really called into question the link between theory and practice in the tourism industry. 
um, and the link or the lack thereof, um, you know, when you think about it, really must be a thorny issue as it applies to um, all disciplines, especially of those, of those that are out there that have a practical orientation, which is by and large most of them. Um, in tourism, there's really been a feeble effort to bridge this rather large canyon. And uh, so in the presentation today, um, I'm going to hit you with, with quite a bit of information and, you know, with some apologies about, about the volume, but I'll, I promise to slow down in, in the places where I really think that, um, you know, we need to slow down and, and focus on some of the content here. Okay, I'm going to keep my fingers crossed that everything works with the technology. Um, so far, so good. So uh, just by way of, of outline, I'm going to look at uh, a, a, sort of a quick introduction with a purpose. We're going to survey you know, what's been done in the area of knowledge in tourism. This is certainly not epistemology and looking at the whole, the whole gamut, but uh, we'll look at uh, knowledge management and knowledge transfer, which are very closely related to uh, uh, knowledge translation. And then we're going to look at a case study of over tourism in Corsica, France, which really does quite nicely dovetail with, with some of the research that I'm, I'm doing on ecotourism. Not specifically in that area, but it's nice to come full circle with some, some new research. Uh, this presentation is new research that I'm doing and uh, trying to link it back into, uh, into ecotourism. Okay. And then a, a very quick conclusion. So um, just as I've just mentioned, the research stems from the COVID-19 discussion on Trinet. Trinet is our Tourism Research International Network, which has approximately 9,000 people around the world. Um, we, you know, we discuss things like closed borders, quarantines, cancellations, diminished revenue, lost employment. Uh, and somebody mentioned the other day to me that globally we're, we're losing about 1 million jobs per day because of COVID-19, which is absolutely significant. Uh, and so the C-19 issue reminds us of times of crisis compel us to ask new questions and to seek new answers about the way forward in tourism. So, uh, you know, when, when we have these shocks to a system, which I know many of you will be studying in our sustainability program, uh, it's really how we respond to these shocks. So let me just give you an idea of uh, how the discussion, or, or a couple of pieces of the discussion at least anyway, in, re in, in reference to the role of tourism with the COVID-19 crisis and more broadly as well. So one, one scholar had written that, uh, whilst I appreciate that academia is here to theorize, wouldn't it be great if this theory could provide realistic solutions directly applicable to the industry? It may be just me, but I'm increasingly struggling with how much academic research is di uh, disconnected from reality. And Jafar Jafari uh, shot back, uh, and he's one of the founding fathers of the tourism uh, field. He says that your message conveys what some of us have tried to say or do elsewhere, but with limited success. Yes, there is a gap, actually a canyon between theory and practice in tourism with no established bridges connecting the two. So here we have an individual who's been in right from the get-go uh, of the tourism field who has struggled trying to find that connection between theory and practice for many, many years. Okay, so uh, the problem has traditionally been that uh, scholars have had or, or do have little to no industry experience, and you're looking at one here, uh, absolutely, all right, is, is that in, in the absence of such a connection, it makes it really difficult to, uh, to imagine how the connection might be, all right? We are tasked as professors with uh, certain roles and responsibilities, and sometimes there's a swing and a miss when it comes to that connection with the industry. So also we fail to write our findings in a language that's suitable for practitioners and policymakers. I, I might just mention practitioners, and when I mention practitioner, it means policymakers and decision makers, and people working in the industry, obviously, okay? So I might just stick with practitioners. Uh, and this comes from Douglas Fletchling, and, and Douglas is another one of those individuals who's been in the tourism uh, scholarly uh, element for many, many years. He says that, and this is back in 2004, although he's been around since the 70s, relatively little transmission of knowledge is taking place from leading journals, to industry practitioners. Okay, so it's being felt in a number of different corners. So in general, there's a poor connection between scholars and practitioners. And I have to say, I've got Tourism Industry Association of Ontario up there. I've, I've traveled quite a bit in the past. We've visited many countries. And, I, and I'm I'm sorry to say that Canada has probably one of the poorest uh, track records of a linkage that exists between industry and the academic side of things. 
industry tends to be plugged in with government. So if you look at those three key stakeholders, it seems to be that that academics are not finding their way uh, around the table with these groups. Um, so there are questions over the value of research in, in applied fields like tourism. Uh, and just with the quote below, I wrote a paper in 2015 on the ethics of excellence in tourism research. And one of the conclusions I came to is our, our focus appears to be more heavily weighted on this neoliberal culture, uh, erotic culture that exists out there, emphasizing number of citations, where we publish, uh, who we publish, um, and some of the competitive elements that are built in, into the game in this day and age. All right, we're, we're fortunate in Canada that we don't have to play this game like uh, folks in the UK or Australia or New Zealand or other, other uh, regions around the world. Um, so academic freedom is alive and well in the country, but um, you know, for many people around the world, it's very much about that, that middle bullet point and really is sometimes uh, forcing us or pushing us away from that connection with, with, uh, with industry. And so shouldn't we learn how to cooperate for mutual benefit becomes a very important question for us. If we want to solve industry problems, which we should in tourism because of the applied nature of what we're doing, we really, it begs the question as to why we're not doing that. Um, and so it doesn't help that fragmentation of the industry is characterized by a series of interrelated parts. If you look at the, uh, the, the graphic on the right hand side here, we've got accommodations, we've got transportation, we've got attractions and entertainment, we've got facilities. There's a whole bunch of things that make up the tourism industry, many of which sometimes uh, operate in isolation to the point where some people don't call it an industry, but they call it, uh, you know, a series of different interrelated sectors or sometimes interrelated sectors that sometimes do their own thing. All right. Uh, plus the fact that w whether people are sitting around your table at a restaurant, we don't really know whether they're tourists or, or local people. Um, McCannell says that the industry is a, a amorphous, it kind of spreads out all over the place, it's really hard to pin down, and Laws and Scott call it a mosaic, right, uh, and with, with respect to the nature of tourism studies scholarship. And I often wonder, you know, we're really not like, for example, biology. Uh, if you're writing a paper on insect or entomology or insect biology, you're not going to submit it to a, to a journal on, on primate, primate biology. Right, and in tourism, we just submit our papers everywhere. So we don't have a lot of specialization, and I think we really should have more specialization in the tourism industry because it makes it easier to track down information and use it for our purposes. Right, and the other issue that I want to put in here is because it, that we'll get to with the case study on on Corsica is that tourism is really driven by a profit and pleasure agenda. Right, it's a commercial entity, and um, it's as much as we possibly can do to make money, and as tourists. Uh, really, the the summum bonum or the mate, the pleasure in life is really about uh, traveling as much as we can and getting value for money um, and and taking care of our own self interest. So the purpose of the of the presentation is is to take aim at the historically entrenched divide between research and tourism practice, as we know, to develop this tourism knowledge translation framework. Okay, so this is going to be the main part of the presentation, and to apply this model to ecotourism in Corsica. I've got Tefi on the on the right hand side here, the Tourism Education Futures Initiative, and so organizations like this have talked about things related to industry and and theory and such, but I don't think we've done a good enough job. All right, um, and the COVID nineteen uh, situation certainly spelled that out for us. So let me just very quickly take a, a look at a couple of areas of of knowledge that we have dealt with. One is knowledge management. Right, and which is again very quickly identification, measurement, storage, organization, replication, sharing, and integration of knowledge through innovation. We could also say there, and in tourism, uh, knowledge management is really about um, uh, strategic management and competitive advantage in the tourism uh, tourism organizations. So when we're when we're managing knowledge, it's really about competitive advantage and strategic management as well. So we're adding value to goods and services. The second one here is knowledge transfer, and uh, which is the process that underpin innovation. There we see innovation again, which in, in turn are the key to competitiveness of tourism organizations and destinations. So, you know, Chris Cooper's done the most research in the field on this, in knowledge management and knowledge transfer. And once again, it's competitiveness and how our organizations are running and using knowledge for, for their benefit. We've also done a bit of research on cross-cultural problems in the transfer of knowledge, okay? So that becomes very important because, you know, tourism is uh, cosmopolitan, right? We, uh, we have people speaking different languages and moving to different places and spaces and such. And so 
um, how we use knowledge from that cross-cultural context becomes very important. And over on the right-hand side, I won't spend much time on this, is a little mini case study of um, Simon Hubs Hudson, who was used to be at Calgary, now he's down in the US, uh, wrote a paper in 2013 describing an innovative model of knowledge transfer in South Carolina, where the state government has created centers of economic excellence. It makes me think what we should be doing with respect to tourism uh, in Ontario and tourism in Canada. Right in areas of advanced economy, three three public universities and state received between two and five million in education lottery funds to be matched with non-state government funding. Proliferation of research activity taking place from this program, resulting in several centers, 1.4 billion in non-state funding, 8,000 new jobs, all with the purpose of transferring knowledge between researchers and industry. So that's knowledge transfer, and that's a wonderful little case study that exists. This, to suggest or to point in the direction of some of the things that we could be doing. Well, I've got one other example for you, and this comes from Duxbury and colleagues uh, that I found and put into my uh, paper um, that's going through the review process right now. Closer ties must be built between researchers and practitioners during the research process, not at the end. So here's a group of scholars suggesting how is it that, you know, and, and the word that comes to mind for me is this ask element of transdisciplinarity of how we can get people together and solve some real world problems. But it demands that we need to be reflexive and that we have to you know, be reciprocal in, in our processes and who we deal with and who the stakeholders are and the institutions and governance structures at all are very important in solving these real, real world problems. Okay, so this is um, knowledge transfer at a process of during 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 uh, the creation of new knowledge and, and pulling people together, and this means developing new spaces for collaboration where those might take place in in a formal uh, university or institutional context, or whether it is actually out there in the workplace, allowing practitioners to be co-researchers in knowledge creation. We'll go back to transdisciplinarity again. And then paying close attention to how research can help at implementation stage stages. And the only you know issue that I would have with this is that we really need to be objective and not subjective. When we invite people from the community, we have to make sure, especially when you think about tourism, that commercial agenda doesn't creep back into the equation. So that it is our own organizational self-interest that is at hand here from that subjectivity standpoint and not looking at things more objectively. Okay, um, so let's now look at knowledge translation. Here's the third one, and this is what we're gonna be dealing with. So discussed as far back as the beginning of the 20th century, as I, I love to go into the historical elements of the concepts that I, that I deal with to give me sort of a, a basic foundation on why some innovations are used in society, but not others. So here's Tarde in 1903, who was talking about innovations. And then during the 1940s, knowledge, translation as the domination utilization of scientific knowledge right and this is Huberman drawing on you know uh, information that was being thrown out to us in the 1940s so important in, in this whole structure is the Canadian Institutes of Health Research and the World Health Organization the knowledge translation uh, conceptual framework that I'm going to show you comes from CIHR and the World Health Organization has put so much value in into this into this process that they, they've adopted it themselves, right? So knowledge creation, distillation, dissemination alone are not sufficient to ensure that the right type of knowledge is available to make the decisions that we need uh, to, to, to move forward. So I've, I've um, italicized that because we're gonna talk about what should be the right type of knowledge as we move forward. We've got a tremendous number of, of journals out there in tourism, lots and lots of research, but we have to identify that research that's gonna push us forward. So let's give you a, a bit of a, um, of a definition of knowledge translation that comes from the group that's really work, working with that, that healthcare model. So it's dynamic. We've got lots of people who are involved in many different places and spatially it's dynamic too. It's iterative in the, in the sense that, you know, it feeds back into itself. How is it that after the first iteration that we can make changes in subsequent iterations? So that's a process that includes synthesis, dissemination, exchange, and ethically sound. Love to see that in a definition. Application of knowledge to improve health, provide more effective health services and products, and strengthen the healthcare, healthcare system. So my job today is to slowly move that into uh, a tourism context. We'll, we'll adapt that def definition as we move forward. Um, I found interesting in my research that um, there's two really 
very uh, large challenges in moving this whole agenda forward. The first is a volume of research, 17,000 new biomedical books per year, which is absolutely mind boggling to me, and 30,000 biomedical journals, which is equally mind boggling with an increase of 7% of these per year. So physicians, and this is the group that we're talking about, need to read on average 19 original articles each day to keep abreast of their field. That's just not gonna happen, right? And the second side of that is the complicated nature of scientific work. How is it that we can make our research? When you say a book is accessible, it means that people can understand what you're saying. And how is it that we can make our research accessible to the people who really need it? Okay, so uh, we need to place new knowledge into the hands of policymakers and practitioners as quickly as possible, avoiding these research practice gaps. And you can see in the healthcare field that this becomes very important. We don't want to have this new cutting edge research sitting on our desks. We need to get it out there. We need to close these gaps and making sure that we're helping people as quickly as we possibly can. Um, and we see that with COVID-19 right now with these trials on a vaccine, right? We have to go and jump through the proper hoops, but you know, the one who gets there first is, uh, stands to make billions and billions of dollars. So other questions, you know, what should be transferred? To whom should research knowledge be transferred? By whom should research knowledge be transferred? How should research knowledge be transferred? And what effect should this knowledge have that is being transferred as well? So these are some of the questions that the healthcare folks have been grappling with in terms of coming up with the right and the best model. Okay, so here um, is the system that we're going to deal with. This is the knowledge to action model <clears throat> that comes from Strauss, Strauss and colleagues. It's broken down into two main parts. The first one is knowledge creation, as you can see right in the middle with that inverted um, triangle. And don't worry, I'm going to show this to you in a, in a number of different slides as we move forward. But really, uh, what's happening here is we have knowledge inquiry. Right, and so we have all this breadth of knowledge that exists at our hands out there around the world. We synthesize that knowledge and we turn that into various products and tools that we can use to, so to help solve the problems that we have. So which, as you see on the right hand side, what we're doing is we're filtering this knowledge or tailoring this knowledge so that we can effectively utilize it for our purposes. This goes into an action cycle. And again, I won't spend too much time in this because you'll see it again. We identify a problem. We identify, review, and select knowledge that you can see from that inverted triangle. We adapt that knowledge to the local context. We assess the barriers of the knowledge. We select, tailor, and implement solutions from that knowledge. We then go into this systematic planning process that's so probably familiar to us of monitoring, evaluating. And what I like here is with step number seven, how we sustain that knowledge into the, into the future through our modeling and through our frame, frameworks. But also, I like the fact that it has sustainability, sustainability elements that really dovetail on what we're talking about today and with respect to the class, right, uh, more broadly. So let's look at knowledge creation. Um, it is, once again, starting with knowledge inquiry. Again, sorry, I didn't put in the tailoring knowledge on the right-hand side, but knowledge inquiry is, is marked by knowledge distillation and fluidity. We distill that knowledge, and there needs to be a fluidity that exists between different types of knowledge. We'll get to that in the latter part of this slide. I also liked in my research with Gabay and, and LeMay, this element of mind lines. These are internal states that are flexible and incorporate a diversity of different approaches. This really opens the door for the incorporation of different ways of thinking, um, different traditions and different domains in research <clears throat> and scholarship. So it's really not just our quantitative, excuse me, <clears throat> but also qualitative research um, and stories and philosophy and conceptual fr frameworks. So I know we talked about those randomized trials, which become very important, right, for, for, for getting solutions out there for us. But there's other ways, once again, of thinking about the world. And we need to incorporate that uh, social science approach as well as the sort of the, um, the, the hardcore natural science research that we, that we rely on. When once again, that element of transdisciplinary that we, we talked about before. The second one is synthesis, okay, the focus on pooling the full potential of global research rather than individual studies. I, uh, I highlight global there as well because it's not just research that's taking place in Canada to solve issues and problems that, that we have in Canada, but you know what's, what's taking place out there, for example, in New Zealand and Australia that can help us solve problems here. We need to focus on research quality. Uh, and the fact that not all studies ought to be translated 
and we need best evidence for policy and practice, right? And, and we're going to focus more on, on, on this evidence-informed decision-making model that's built into the system too. Okay, and the last one here is our methods and our tools and our products. So the top studies are synthesized into decision-making tool, such as best practice guidelines. So for example, what do we have that exists out there for, let's say, ecotourism, what are best practices for ecologists that we can use <clears throat> very effectively in the development of ecologists in the future? All of this information then gets placed into a, a knowledge translation repository. And so we have methods, uh, which are a process or a series of steps to organize a knowledge translation activity. And this is where our frameworks or our models that uh, uh, come handy uh, in creating or a dissemination plan, for example. And then the tools or the products or instruments to carry out these steps of knowledge translation. You know, for example, a checklist for a dissemination plan. So a checklist, not just the framework for that dissemination plan, but some actual tools that we can use to uh, <clears throat> operationalize what we're talking about. Okay, and then you might be asking yourselves, um, how, you know, what do we do with this knowledge? How do we manage it? And how do we make sure that we're doing it uh, as efficient job as possible and making sure it's the right stuff and presented in the right way? Okay, so the first, uh, so it's prioritized and reviewed three times. The first reviewer writes a summary of the statement based on the research. The second one reviews for verification independent of the first review. And then there's a review checked by the original author for accuracy before, before being posted. So the, so the author of the research gets to check it to say, yep, thumbs up, okay, please put it into the repository. Right, and then so once that information gets to, into the repository, we're going to show you how you can access that quite uh, uh, shortly. So, let's just get into uh, to section B of that of that action cycle. Recall we had that inverted triangle in the middle, and it was followed by all of these different steps of of the action cycle. And we also said that this is a systematic planning process. We identify the problem, we identify, review, select knowledge, and we went through that process of adapting looking at barriers, um, tailoring and, and implementing solution, a monitor, evaluate and sustain. So this is what we're, we're gonna go through shortly when I apply that to a case study in, uh, in tourism. So I mentioned this evidence-informed decision-making model, which is a, a really important aspect of this whole process. The EIDM is managed by National Collaborating Center for Methods and Tools, hosted by McMaster. So when we think about this in a tourism context, it could be maybe Brock University, if we get this process up and running in Canada, in Ontario or Canada, where uh, is the funding coming from? If we can track down some funding and who are our partners going to be in Ontario and across the country? And indeed, as we'll look at later around the world, right? Um, because there's just so much knowledge out there that needs to be handled. Okay, so this ED, EIDM rather is the engine that finds uses and shares knowledge in public health from that repository and so users are able to refine their search through a process that contains those uh, seven steps slightly modified and what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you this in the next slide to, to, to determine how that happens all right so what happens here is we have a clearly defined or a question or a problem and what we can do is we can have users click on any one of these steps so if you wanted some information on implementation of um, uh, anything that has to do with with our program planning for tourism we can we can click on implementation and see a whole series of different implementation studies that have relevance to what we're talking about in ecotourism in a lesser developed country or a developed country with a whole series of other considerations that are built into how these things have been implemented similar with evaluation definitions, searching, appraising, synthesizing, and adapting. This has been used for the healthcare field, but this doesn't mean that we couldn't change this, right, and adapt this to tourism, uh, planning, management, and development. So there's uh, some flexibility that we could build into this. We'll keep that in mind as we move forward. There's also rec recognition for practice practitioners in our, in our healthcare uh, field, but also in the tourism field as well. The EIDM allows for the development of learning modules, so we can have learning modules that are built into this whole uh, knowledge translation pro process. Practitioners will obtain competencies at various stages of the evidence model, and for example, we could have a, a, a program or um, a paper on critical appraisal of qualitative studies, 
And so the practitioners receive a certificate of competence from the NCCMT after each module is completed. So now what we're doing is we're in the process of building um, competencies, right, for people and how they use this knowledge in their respective areas of fields. And this is just, um, I won't spend too much time on this. It's kind of a, a synthesis of what we've just been talking about. If you're interested in a tool on implementation, Right, there's a whole series of knowledge translation and related activities information that you'll find in that repository, right? So you'll have it on um, organizational change or leadership or KT theories or, and the list goes on. I'm going to use this in a second and elaborate on this to build it into the, to the tourism industry. Okay, and just before we get into tourism, my last slide on setting all of this up is you know, a, a good researcher should be looking outside of just, you know, not have the conceptual blinders on, but let's look at some of the other programs that have been developed along these lines. So I looked at, at the University of Western Ontario and the Center for Research and Education on Violence Against Women and Children has a very similar type of knowledge translation process. And what I found interesting with this one is that they can communicate to the public in a number of different ways. We can use backgrounders, share practice uh, guidance, essential research facts and intervention approaches. We can develop briefs. We can have a glossary of terms. We can set up infographics or issue-based news uh, newsletters. We can develop reports or resource spotlights and videos and podcasts and webinars that we can, we have so much at, uh, at hand in this day and age that we can use to communicate the message out to uh, a number of different brokers or stakeholders that would find this information very useful. And often in this format, it becomes a lot easier for them to internalize the information that we're talking about. Okay, so how um, does it relate? So we're looking at 11.30 here. I'll um, see if I can hustle along, see if we can get it to maybe 11.45 or 11.50. Uh, so how does the knowledge translation relate to tourism? So what, what I've done here is I, I essentially I've just modified that definition by Strauss as a dynamic and iterative process that includes a synthesis, dissemination, exchange, ethically sound application of knowledge to improve policy, planning, development, management of tourism at all scales. Not just regional scales or local scales or national scales, but all sorts of different scales that, uh, that are applicable to the problem at hand. Probably better uh, to implement, uh, you know, at a, at a regional scale or at a local scale, but uh, and so maybe some more challenges at building uh, greater capacity uh, to develop this thing uh, around the world from an international standpoint. And that's why I think it's critical to have lots and lots of partners, regionally, nationally, and internationally, as, as we build this this program. So here's our case study on over tourism in Corsica, in France. Just to, from a geographical standpoint, to give you a sense of where we're talking about, right in the Mediterranean, um, sandwiched well, just south of France, and obviously just west of Italy. Um, so you, at least you know where, where we're talking about. And just a little bit more information on the paper that I submitted to Marilyn, and she likely shared with you. I think she shared with you on Scandala Marine Protected Area, uh, and this is a marine protected area that was developed in 1975. It's also a UNESCO World Heritage Site and it's got a designation in 1983. And I just picked out a few little bits and pieces from the paper. We've got 300,000 visitors between June and August. And we know this is a tourism season. And so when we really focus a, a, a large density of individuals on a short period of time, it opens up, and we're talking about over tourism. I showed you some pictures on over tourism uh, previously in, in the presentation. It really does create some problems, carrying capacity problems for the for the regions that we that we're uh, focusing on okay so uh, the, the the big issue here is that there's impact packs on the osprey population uh, no limit to the number of, of visiting vessels no approach distance regulations i've done some research on on approach distance regulations for whale watching in the past with brian garrod uh, at the university in wales so we looked at uh, you know from a code of ethics standpoint what should we do we should be traveling in the same direction as whales we should be getting closer than 100 meters to the whales and many other guidelines as well that becomes important in really mitigating or managing the issues that take place within you know not only marine protected areas but you know this spills over to to, to any sort of program that we have in the use of animals or um, certainly other facets of the industry as well so when you talk about osprey, this is this is what we're talking about. We 
This is, uh, we, we have Osprey in our neck of the woods here, um, you know, which is up at a cottage recently on Lake Kuchiching, and we've got built platforms for Osprey to, for nesting, uh, nesting sites and some migratory species, um, which is also referred to as the fish hawk. And so they're migratory species around here because of their main, uh, well, their sole element of their diet is fish. And so when, when our lakes start to freeze over, they have to find places where they can go fishing. Okay, uh, so let, let's see if we can start to build this little uh, case study into our, our knowledge translation framework. I'll, I'll show you once again that the inverted triangle. So the need to access current knowledge from various knowledge domains as they apply to tourism in this, in this case study, synthesize which products and tools might be developed for our policymakers and our practitioners. And I'll go back to the, uh, to the, to the authors of the paper that I, I, uh, I sent around, Mon Monty and colleagues. You know what prompted me to 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 actually start working on this on this uh, knowledge translation framework was reading their paper and the call for more collaboration needed within the tourism industry. So collaboration is key, but also the need for evidence-based scientific data to address the situation. Where do we find that in tourism? We have lots and lots of paper, but papers and books, but we don't have a process that allows us to use this evidence-based scientific data to build in, into a conceptual framework. And so between Monty and colleagues and COVID-19 really got me to sit down and scratch my head about how do we solve this problem and what sort of tools or methods exist out there that, uh, or uh, really I'm talking about frameworks, what frameworks uh, uh, exist out there. And when Marilyn was introducing me, she said I was you know, uh, involved in, in bringing information in, likely kicking and screaming into the tourism industry from these other disciplines. Here's another example of me not, not drawing from tourism knowledge, but drawing from knowledge that exists outside of our field, bringing it into tourism so that we can fortify our field to do things, to think, to, to you know, take off the conceptual blinders and start looking at problems laterally. Now, one of the things I do as a, as a scholar is, uh, is I'm involved in the development of conceptual frameworks. And all the conceptual frameworks, uh, when I compare this graph to all the ones I've created in the past, this one is definitely the ugliest, for goodness sakes. Okay, so I apologize about that, but we'll slow down and take some time with it. There's just a lot of information here. If you look on the left-hand side, what I'm suggesting here is we've got primary sectors in the tourism industry. We've got accommodation, food and beverage, transportation, travel to trade, and tourism services. And under that, we have primary products. And this is information that I've drawn from the literature, obviously, okay? So we have pleasure products, we have personal quest, we've got human endeavor, so you know, visiting built heritage um, attractions and such. We've got nature-based, for example, ecotourism, and uh, nature-based tourism, which is broader. And we've got business, which is meetings, incentives, conferences, and exhibitions. So these seem to be our primary products. There's other examples, but we'll leave it there. On the on the right hand side of that three academic forms or two, I'm calling them, we've got primary tiers, which involve our primary disciplines: anthropology, animal studies, biology, business, economics, environmental studies, and the list goes on. So what I've done is because we just it's so hard to tap into all this knowledge. We've got something like business ethics, right? So I went to the Journal of Business Ethics. That would be that would be a second tier academic realm. And what I simply did with our, our tier three is I took all of the, out of the Journal of Business Ethics, I took all of the little subsections that de, or sub, sub areas that they deal with in this broader area of business ethics, which comes from an even broader area of business and philosophy and ethics. So, and again, I won't spend the time to go through them, but what, what really I'm, I'm demonstrating to you is there's a tremendous amount of knowledge and how that breaks down and how we can use it into uh, constituent parts and how they relate to the problems that exist for the, uh, for the tourism industry. So what we could do is we could take out elements of business ethics like CSR, corporate, corporate social responsibility and corporate sustainability, and we could use technology and then we could use, so I've got STEM down here, right? Is you know, a mathematics, engineering, and technology and such. Um, we could use technology, and then we've got also sustainability. We could talk about the sustainable citizen and poverty and inequality and the UN Sustainable Development Goals and such. So we're drawing from that area as well to pull into this, what I'm calling a research industry zone of intersection for knowledge 
um, translation and tourism. Right, you'll recognize that that little uh, conceptual framework in the middle. So what I'm trying to do is I'm sm trying to smash together the academic side of things with the industry side of things in a way that's manageable. Okay, so let's move forward. So hypothetically, we're, we're going to now move into our action cycle as we apply it to our Corsica case study, right? And I'm simply going to go through the various different stages of the action cycle. So we've got the problem, we've got a higher and unregulated tourism in the reserve has led to lower breeding performance of osprey in the reserve. This is what we get from the paper. We also get that this is a longitudinal study, study from, from 1977 to 2014. This is great in biology. We don't typically have a lot of these studies in tourism, longitudinal that is. Not attributed to decline in prey, so there seems to be enough prey species in the marine protected area. But the problem is we've got three times the number of boats that are inside the reserve than are outside the reserve. So what the problem is, it's creating stress in osprey. There's a, de a decrease in prey pro provisioning, all right, for the young, and there's more time of, of osprey that are leaving the nest. And we find this typically, especially with bird species, that the, the approach distances as we get closer and closer, they just, they take off. Okay, we have it with alligators and crocodiles too. Tourism is providing problems there, is that um, our crocodiles will just get, they'll abandon the nest, right, and leave these nests vulnerable to predation. Right, so let's go through our, our action cycle. Identify the problem, identify, review, and select knowledge. Okay, so we've identified the problem here. We're moving on to 1B, which is identify, review, and select knowledge. And so this is where we have to start thinking about stakeholders, their various roles, how they can be used to address the issue. Is it park staff? Is it uh, tourism operators? Is it destination management organizations? And the list goes on from there. But who are the stakeholders and wh what role do they play in this issue? We need to review our causes and effects of the issue with stakeholders, address ex expected outcomes of potential interventions, and then we need to select knowledge from the repository. So for example, what we could draw out of that repository is ecological impacts in marine protected areas and link that to tourism stress responses in animals from tourism, issues of zoning, temporal zoning and spatial zoning, codes of ethics, what's being done on animal ethics. All of this stuff should be made available to us to help address this problem. Second, we go into adapt knowledge to the local context. So how do we use this knowledge that we're taking out of a repository uh, in Corsica? What is the processes that we need to uh, undertake in, in updating this knowledge and how we can use this in Corsica? And then we need to also start to think about and scratch our head over how we can gauge success of past mitigating factors. So what about permits? You know, there's just so many people visiting these places and the, and the tourism operators are pushing for this so we can all make some money. There's demand, let's provide supply, right? But maybe we need to start thinking about what those mitigating factors are in, in terms of, of permits. We know we use permits in Ontario. New Zealand uses permits quite effectively. We pick this stuff up from the literature, so maybe we need to start thinking about those along those lines. We also have to think about compatibility. We have two main paradigms in tourism. The first is a mass tourism paradigm, which is what you're looking at here on the right-hand side, and the other one is the alternative tourism paradigm. And so what's taking place is we have, once again, a clash of two paradigms. We've got mass tourism, where really we should be talking about alternative tourism and sustainability and ecotourism. There hasn't been the right processes put into place to help manage these two quite different elements of demand. All right, so we need to assess the barriers to knowledge use. So what are some of the barriers as they boil down to individual and our skill sets uh, from the perspective of operators? How about our organizational skill sets? Maybe we have weak leadership or, a, or an organizational culture that, that, that doesn't take into consideration sustainability. Um, what are our system gaps in when we think about our social and ecological systems um, um, issues that we, we need to, you know, for Corsica in general and, you know, more specifically with the marine protected area and how that uh, uh, leads to governance, legal, administrative, political, natural, resource, economic, social, cultural conditions that dictate our policy for the marine protected area. All that stuff has to be assessed. And then we also have to build that into, as we've just started to talk about with respect to this slide, our profit versus pleasure versus preservation, keeping in mind that preservation is saving from use and, uh, or, or, and conservation is saving for use, right? So preservation, this isn't a preservation 
um, scenario, it doesn't seem like, because if we were to pull back completely, there's going to be a lot of people who are upset, tourists, operators, and the local community. A lot of people travel to Corsica, as, and this is part of the attraction base. Maybe one of the other barriers is we just don't have the right type of knowledge at hand. All right, and so hopefully, you know, we can draw again from the repository or through another iterative process, we can develop new knowledge. I'm going to give you an example of how we can develop new knowledge to help solve this problem as well. We select tailor and implement solutions, okay, resources available for change, stakeholder inclusion, new skills, training, human resources, demands, and stakeholder flexibility. I've got, um, you know, I love this, uh, and I've put a lot of stock in the past in this visioning process and the things that we value. So on the right-hand side with our visioning process, we've got the past, which is hindsight, the present, which is insight, and the future, which is foresight. And we need to live this vision, right, as we move ourselves on into the future. So Corsica needs to have a visioning process that they undertake in order to, again, balance profit and versus preservation or conservation and sustainability, right? And we need to embrace um, uh, innovation. So we see innovation again. So these system shocks, right, catalyze uh, new innovations. Uh, and so we should also say that Van, Van de Ven and his uh, colleagues, or I'm not sure if it's uh, him or her, but uh, in 2017, I've just drawn on this study, but Van de Ven has done a lot of work on innovation as a journey. It's following different stages and pathways from initiation to development to implement, implementation. And it needs to catalyze uh, new th thinking whether it's demarketing, as you'll find studies on that in the Journal of Ecotourism, for example, so we'll, we'll get new knowledge out of that. Or what about new technology and virtual reality and webcams? They have been used to good effects, and I want to see how we can build this into our case study here. So what I'm going to introduce to you, this is a paper that just got published uh, a couple of months ago on personalized interactive real-time tours from my standpoint, and it was, once again, my response to the COVID-19 process. So we are in the midst of a travel and tourism transition right now. Probably got another five or six minutes to go here, hopefully, I think, at least anyway, so bear with me. Okay, in the midst of a travel and tourism transition, there's, there's some key uh, disruptive influences that exist out there. We've got new technologies. We have periodic chaos in markets and economies. We have health and safety concerns. We have environmental crises. And we've got this issue with transportation where 90% of the ecological footprint in the Seychelles, for example, is from flying. We find this everywhere. We want to be ecotourists, but yet we still get on a plane and fly halfway around the world to go and be ecotourists, right? So there's some disruptive influences that are taking us off the, uh, off the ball. So I want to sp speak a little bit about these personalized uh, interactive real-time tours and to see if this could help solve the problem in Corsica. So PERTS, Right, we could use 5G streaming in real time using 360 degree view cameras, webcams, drones with appropriate infrastructure. We know that around the world right now, remember we said that there's a million jobs that are lost in tourism. What we wanna do is make sure that gentlemen on the right hand side of this slide still can make a living. So why don't we come up with some sort of a system where I can sit in my living room, pay him $200, he could have somebody operating cameras and such, Right, and in real time, I can discuss with him some of the issues and problems. He can talk about this tree, the buttress of this tree, how old this tree, and the fact that it's probably got a thousand different organisms that are living off of that tree. We chop that tree down and there's a problem. So how is it that we can put money in his pocket still? Um, because, you know, we could, we need to start thinking about how we consume tourism experiences. So these new tourists consume products by staying at home. And this uh, dovetails with alternative hedonism. This is Soper, Soper's research on alternative hedonism. It's not just about me being hedon hedonistic, maximizing pleasure and minimizing pain, but we flip that around and doing something that's actually good for the destination instead of relying on ourselves. How about persons with disabilities, people who can't actually get themselves, in this case, Costa Rica? Um, but wouldn't it be great for them to have that ecotourism-like experience at home? And what about the sustainable citizen, the person who doesn't want to dump, you know, uh, we talked about the Seychelles and transportation and 90% of the ecological footprint, somebody who doesn't want to contribute to that, but who wants to have a similar type of experience, but once again, be at home, right? Yes, we're not there. We don't get that sensation of being in the tropical rainforest, but we have to make certain sacrifices. And then what about the social costs of flying and over tourism that we're trying to step away from as well? 
right? But we could also access other parts of the supply chain. If this is Costa Rica, we're not going to be talking about Costa Rica right now, is to get some food. You know, maybe we're not taking care of that ecological footprint here, but having Costa Rican food so that we can access other plies, uh, elements of the supply chain to bring that food up into Canada so we can have a meal that we would otherwise have in Costa Rica while, while enjoying this experience. So maybe we can have some of the aroma of what Costa Rica is all about. Okay, so, um, so as it relates to Corsica, you know, what, what, how can we apply this technology? You know, I've got on the right-hand side this element of demarketing. So the Mighty Five campaign brought an extra five, oh, sorry, an extra half million visitors to parks. Now Utah wants to steer them to other places. It becomes a problem in national parks. Uh, they're demarketing in New Zealand and they're demarketing in Australia as well, right? These We're loving these places to death and that's becoming a problem. So um, actively demarketing, um, actively setting up lottery systems, actively putting in uh, different um, permit and zoning issues, and then maybe creating, as we've done in other areas, and I'll show you a slide in a second, a visitor center with live streaming. So we don't have to have everybody out at the attraction, right? We can have maybe one person with all of this technology and have other people back at a visitor center enjoying this experience in real time and maybe talking to somebody who's out there as a point person, right? And having that interaction. The problem with this is that maybe per, uh, the experience catalyzes even more interest in, in Osprey. So we have to um, we have to manage and mitigate that as well. We we don't know what the impacts are going to be yet, but uh, it'd be interesting to see as an alternative to see how this has an impact on you know what we're talking. And here's here's the example that I was talking about before. This these, this is in Lascaux in France, so not too far away from from Corsica. Um, there was so much in the way of problems with Lascaux caves. It was the carbon dioxide and the introduction of bacteria and uh, protozoans and such and viruses that was having a huge impact on these 11,000 year old caves. So the response was to build another cave, right? And duplicate it exactly as what we find in the original cave. So we, we pull people through the, uh, the dummy cave, right? And give them a similar type of experience without disrupting you know, you know, the main attraction. attraction. So monitoring the type of knowledge used, quantitative versus storytelling and outcomes. We could monitor tourist to local density markers, boat traffic inside and outside the park, tourist to local conflict ratios, and obviously the impacts on osprey and other flora and fauna becomes the key element here. And we can also sort of think about seasonality and how we might mitigate the seasonal aspects of, of tourism, because it really is between June and August that most of the problems are taking place. Or maybe we activate that visitor center more thoroughly in some of the high uh, shoulders, uh, not the shoulder seasons, but the, the peak seasons. Okay, and then I'm just gonna finish up quickly here. We evaluate outcomes, develop key collaborative relationships based on trust and cooperation. I've done research in the past on reciprocal altruism or I scratch your back and you scratch my back to see how that works for sustainability, not necessarily for profit, but for sustainability and um, you know developing a new ecotourism model. Um, uh, I mentioned it's an iterative um, process here. Problems not solved in the first round, we can learn from or continue to learn from uh, and build in better capacity in the future. And as new methods and tools are added to the repository, practitioners will be better prepared to address these issues. That's why it's so important to get knowledge into the repository and to build on that knowledge so we can determine where the gaps are and help to fill those gaps in that better connection between theory and practice. And then we sustain, right? Questions emerge in relation to who should be empowered to sustain the initiative, the emerging barriers to sustainability. And for me, this is the biggest one here, the need and the will to, cattle, uh, to crystallize priorities around the long-term management of Osprey alongside tourism benefits. This necessitates a real leap of faith, but we have to have the will to do this. This is the foundation of us moving forward. If we don't have the will from an economic and political standpoint, we can't get anywhere, okay? And so I just want to finish off with the last two slides on is it, you know, I've been dumping all over the, the academics here. All right. But uh, is it just academics who are the problem? Uh, my experience with the industry at a conference in British Columbia several years ago, I spoke on how ethics would increasingly play a part in the future development of the industry. This is like 15 years ago. Um, and some of this has come 
to fruition, right? You, you know, uh, we have competitive advantage if we build um, values and ethics into uh, you know, into our program. So some some operators in some regions are certainly benefiting from, benefiting from that change. But the message I got from industry at that at that conference was: stay in your ivory tower and leave the heavy lifting to industry. But it really takes two to tangle, doesn't it? You know, as we're finding out more and more. Um, so in conclusion, just a couple of questions. I'm not going to summarize all of, of what I've talked about. How, how do we get practitioners, policymakers, and academics to speak the same language? What role does government play as a catalyst in the tourism knowledge translation framework? What role does Brock play? What about international links? Where do the nodes exist in Ontario and across the country? Who funds these enterprises? What are the limitations? And you know, we also need to know. Uh, we also need a new model or approach in the Canadian tourism context because I said that we're really struggling in Canada right now with the connection between uh, academics and industry to get us out of that silo approach and to get us out of playing in our own sandboxes alone. Okay, so let me wrap it up there. Thank you very much for uh, for attending, and I look forward to addressing some of your questions. Wonderful. Thank you so much, David. That was an excellent presentation. Um, you. If you like, you can um, leave presenter mode if that works for you. Um, yeah. to you and then um, and then we can have a chat. I um, first on behalf of of the audience, my um, my class specifically, and of course, uh, the graduate students in our uh, master of sustainability program. Um, and others um, watching your talk today, there's been several questions come through already. <laughs> um, I, I haven't read them in detail, but I'll kind of go over them. But first, um, I just want to extend a thank you. You said you would deliver a, con a lot of content, and you sure did, <laughs> which is fantastic. You gave us a lot to think about. I love the way you highlighted some of the key issues that we face in sustainability science, right? Um, from this sort of challenge of mobilizing knowledge, you know, uh, and, and having academics work close, closely with practitioners, you know, not just at the end, right, but at the beginning of the research and defining the research together um, and considering multiple voices, right, stakeholders, etc. Um, indigenous voices as well, of course. Um, so I thought that was a really great point. The point about, you know, applied work and how it's valued or maybe undervalued, um, thinking about, you know, uh, publications and counting those versus how we actually um, take that knowledge from the bookshelf and translate it so that it can be used and in a timely way. Um, drawing upon public health crisis right now is a great example. I really liked how you weave that into your talk today because and the students have noted here about 10 questions coming in from the students um, have made mention of that fact, right? How does COVID kind of um, change all of, all of those pieces, right? Um, so, that yeah, I really like that. I, I won't say too much more. Um, on that front because I want to get to the specific questions, especially from our students. Um, yep. So I'm, I'm going to read to you one of the first ones here, and I think you've you've addressed it um, to some extent, but Edward, a student of ours, would like you to um, think about, is that issue of the disconnect between the academy and industry an issue of university policy or curriculum design perhaps and what are some of the pragmatic approaches to kind of bridging that gap between the academy and industry and you've touched on it a little bit um, yeah but maybe just briefly speak to that piece right well it's a good good question and I, I really think it's central to what we need to talk about here and and the reason for me to put that slide up on you know, the, the fact that we just can't slow down and, and walk and talk together and share research and do, do things at our own pace is the problem. It's, it's just this neoliberal audit culture that we're living in is, and I want to think of, you know, cite Heidegger, Heidegger here in this calculative mindset instead of the meditative mindset. We all seem to be about logic and productivity, right, at, at the expense of so much else. 
And so we're, we're being pushed to be even more competitive um, amongst ourselves and amongst other institutions and other countries uh, to the point where it really is just about that productivity, about how many publications that we have, our name getting on, on publications with five and six and seven uh, different authors just to get another publication here, for goodness sakes. And maybe we ought to, and, and I really like the question because maybe it's what the university needs to be doing better. I should also say that the, the universities are wedded to that because they, it's a funding model in those other places. The more publications that you have, the more funding that you'll get from the government because you're you're demonstrating a type of competency, right? And so, but I guess maybe what we should be doing is having competencies in other areas that we should be valuing other types of, you know, the work that professors are doing and with a tighter, uh, um, tighter knit, uh, I guess, link between people uh, within the community. We should value that type of research as much as we value a peer reviewed publication. So let's stop pushing and pushing and pushing for more and start pushing uh, and publications so start pushing for those interactions that exist um, with community. I think I can speak about Brock. I think Brock does an excellent job at not looking over our shoulders and pointing the finger at the fact that you've only got a one or two publications this year, right? Or if that even, right? As long as we're busy um, and, and working with communities or in service, a service capacity, I think we really should value that because we're all a little bit different. But let's put up on par uh, the work that we do with communities on par with, with the work that we're doing for our journals and for our books, right? So from an institutional standpoint, we're, we're, we're fortunate here in Canada, um, but other places are not so fortunate because of that funding model that comes from government. You know, I want to add to that. Those are some excellent points, David. I want to add to, you know, I've worked with colleagues in South America where you know, they struggle to even get publications out because they're operating in the, in the second language, right? Trying to yeah. write in English because it seems also we place value on, um, you know, English and English speaking um, uh, academics, right? In these publications. And we, uh, that's a real struggle for people who don't speak English as a first language, trying right. to get, you know, yeah. And, and results out uh, from the studies that they're doing as well. We have another yeah. uh, question from Jillian, who, in the same spirit of thinking about bridging this gap between theory and practice, she's asking, do you think more transdisciplinary skills should be introduced into the education curriculum? For example, knowledge translation and collaboration skills, should those be integrated into course concepts? Now, when we, we may mention course context, I assume that's in the university setting as, as undergraduates and graduate students. Can I assume yes. that? Okay. Yes. Yeah. I'm, I, I'm interpreting that, the question that way too, yes. Yeah. Okay. I, I'm 100% uh, in agreement with the question and the need for that is... Um, uh, I, I can't recall uh, a, a class that I took you know, so many years ago when I was an undergraduate student and graduate student that I took that would prepare me for this, for that connection. Um, and especially as graduate students, being pushed even further away from that connection with, and transdisciplinarity is the key. I'm so glad that, you know, in, in our shop, we talk about transdisciplinarity to the, to the degree that we do, because really what it's suggesting is that we're forcing ourselves or encouraging ourselves, maybe that's a better word, to, to, to do better uh, for, for the people that we ought to be serving. Um, you remember that slide with people sitting around the table from, from the community. This is really what it ought to be about. And, and, and again, we're taking our eye off the ball. So yes, in, emphatically, we ought to do more as undergraduate, uh, in, in our undergraduate programs to encourage this, but also within our graduate programs as well. So this is a message Maybe maybe somebody administration at Brock is, is is tuned into the presentation. I'm not sure about that, but if they if they do, this is a takeaway right from the presentation to see what we ought to do, and maybe a wake up call for us in our our respective programs to say, hey, can we start thinking about this a little bit more? Because I think it's going to be worthwhile for our students in the long run. I just finished a three day um, evaluation of Mount Royal University program, and one of the things that we talked about or that I suggested to them uh, is, is a better a mentoring uh, program. And it's something that we really don't have here at Brock to the degree that we should, but that mentoring element is, you know, uh, 
connecting with people who've gone through the program or not even the program who are connected to to our program who just want to help and and pass on some different competencies to students who really need to get a leg in the door so there's many different vehicles or conduits that we could use to help bridge that gap between industry and um and and the academy right that would be helpful for us and for students in the long run yeah i i have to agree uh, as well that you're getting some great questions and there <laughs> i'm impressed we we've probably got more questions than we than we can get to but there's a few that um are more specific to the case study you presented to allison clark asking um, do you find industries receptive to altering tours and practices to ensure ecological prosperity? Mm. Um, do you think better knowledge translation would help industries become more receptive to changes towards sustainable ecotourism practices? Yeah, yeah, that's that's a really good question, and and I I think well the quick answer to that is yes, we we certainly need a lot more of that, but. You know, in my in my ethics classes, we talk a bit about ignorance, and we're not ignorant if we don't know, right? And so the real task at hand here is to make sure that we are passing along either through government or through industry or through, um, you know, tourism, community, whatever, tourism, I, I meant university programs or college programs. We need to be passing on the right type of knowledge to people who are working in the field because... You know, and I say, say this all the time in my tourism classes, um, tourist, tourists are dumb. They're stupid because they just don't know. And they're not stupid people. They're dumb because they just don't, ha they just don't have the knowledge that will allow them to make a different decision. And we can say the same thing about industry, is that industry, you know, falls down because they haven't been given the right certification or accreditation programs that exist out there. We should have guide training programs right, like Australia and New Zealand have, right? If you want to be an ecotourism guide, you have to have satisfied all these standards and competencies. And, and once the benefit of that is now we can use eco labels and these certifications to, to advertise, to put on our website so that, you know, the prospective tourist who's looking at Corsica to, to look for a tour operator who's ethical and sustainable that, you know, there's virtually none that are there because they're not using eco labels that they have you that they have, that they have uh, won or to satisfy the criteria and the standards that allow them to get to the standard that they need to have in order to conduct ethical tours. So yes, we need a lot more information. Much of my research deals with this about ethics and caring capacity and ecological impacts. And so to answer the question, we some places around the world do a much better job than other places. Corsica is a place where they're not doing a good job because they're stuck in that different mass tourism versus alternative tourism model and they haven't got there yet. So uh, there's a lot of work that needs to be done. So great question. Yeah, I yeah, I agree. Um, another really, there's a couple questions in the context of COVID, right? And, and maybe even outside of COVID, um, one of our students is asking, Jillian is asking, you know, what are some of the effective ways to ensure that we keep relationships strong between researchers and practitioners when we've got different geographic locations involved, schedules, um, and of course, COVID as well. Um, and in, and in, in a similar way, how might we also encourage people to think about um, these kind of experiences from a distance, right? The, the information and communication technologies, those virtual tours that, um, that we you know, can promote, especially now in the context of COVID. Um, and how do you think people can be convinced to use those technologies? Right. Um, you know, and, and will people pay for that experience when it's from their own home, right? Yeah. So, Question, there's two of them there, but yeah, how do we manage to keep these relationships strong in light of, you know, people being geographically separated, the challenges of COVID adding to that uh, or complicating that, and then these virtual tours and, um, you know, some people are hesitant to pay for those, right? Yeah. Maybe yeah. we work on those. Yep. I, I think from the relationship standpoint, I'll, I'll think about it in the local context. It's just more about us as professors getting out into the community 
but also inviting the community into the academic realm as well. Um, I, I know that in classes that I've taught, but let's take my tourism, animals, and ethics class. Um, I, I would bring in somebody from who was a who was a, a a killer whale trainer, right? And she would come into the class and talk about the pros and the cons of marine land. And so the students would absolutely love to hear what she had to say because you know many of the, many of them at one point in time may have wanted to be a trainer because it was such a glamorous type of job. And she said, well, it is glamorous, but here are the problems to the animals. So take, bringing somebody from the community into the academic domain, I think is very important, but I think we have to get out ourselves a lot more into the community and offer up our services and our knowledge to the community in order to do a better job. Um, so that's how I'd handle the first one. And the second one is, is, is who's gonna pay for these, this, this new technology this research is so new that you know I've t I've speculated about it, but I would just argue it would be once again it would be people who are are who want to be sustainable citizens. They don't want to get on a plane and 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 travel to add to the problems of over tourism in these destinations. To say I'm only going to travel once this year, right? And I, and I'm going to stay for a long period of time because this is what we want from an ecotourism standpoint. We want long staying, high spending tourists. So we don't have to have tourists that come in for a weekend and out. You know, all the flights that would be responsible, right, for bringing that that magnitude, that density of people in. So, and then we want tourists to sort of penetrate into into back regions, into the periphery, so we can get them to spend money, not just in cities, right, but we want them to spend money in the periphery as well. All right. So I, I think it's a sustainable um, citizen. I, I'll go back to to people who have disabilities who can't travel who might pay for this. Right, and I'll get back to the to this uh, alternative hedonism component. Is that it's really just not about us all the time. Um, but uh, uh, the the technology, I think, is really going to be a constraint. We need to have the infrastructure in parks and protected areas, like we have it in urban environments, so that um, it, we're almost kind of one step before that one uh, uh, of where we are with these perks. Once we get that stuff set up. But th I'm trying to come up with a solution whereby somebody who's a guide in Costa Rica can start can, can, can still earn money by virtue of the fact that nobody's taking his or her ecotourism anymore, right? So we have, to, we have to grapple with that. And we know it's not going to be the exact same experience, but there might be some people who don't exactly want that experience. They want something that's very similar to it. They want the knowledge because ecotourism is all about ethics, sustainability, and, and learning about nature and natural resources. We can do that from home uh, if we want to sacrifice some of the, the some of those really good cherished aspects of being a tourist. <laughs> That's great. I yeah, I agree. Um, you've had some really good questions here. I'm very impressed. The students yeah. have, have asked many questions. Um, I'm aware of the timing here, so I'm going to have one more question from. Um, Shannon Rutkies, and I think it's uh, it's nice to switch gears a, at least a little bit in terms of um, students seeking out advice, right? Um, okay. So I want to make sure we get that covered, and then uh, and then we'll end our session for today um, on time. But um, and I think this is great because you know students often in grad programs are thinking forward about their futures and where they'll end up and how they don't repeat the problems or you know the past um, in in really negative ways and use the information um, and knowledge that we have now as academics to um, to maybe um, do you know make sure that their work does get out and is used by by people who need it, right? And, and need that in a sort of speedy way. Um, so what advice do you have for someone who's looking to pursue a career in the academy um, in terms of ensuring our research has real world importance? Sure, okay, hi Shannon, uh, thanks for your question. Um, you know, from a grad student perspective, I really think, and, and I think you're in, absolutely in the right program for this, is to um, start to connect and network with people who are working in industry. I, I have a grad student, two grad students right now, one of whom wants to uh, work, I'm on the board of, of directors for this uh, 
uh, uh, you know, geopark in the Niagara region. So, so the one thing that I've found in working with that is a tremendous number of contacts that I've been able to make in a very short period of time about people who are, who are working in, in the community. And a good idea really ge generates enthusiasm amongst people in the community. So I would look towards something, you know, obviously you're in sustainability, the, the UN Sustainable Development Goals are very important for us, those 17 global goals is to try to utilize something, whether it's equality or equity or poverty or life above water, life below water partnerships, the list goes on of these 17 goals. I encourage you to adopt something along those lines and see how it has resonance within the community of choice that you have. If it's the Niagara region, what is it about, uh, you know, the Niagara region that needs some assistance? And that way, you know, you could start to develop those those relationships with people in community and make sure that through your research, you're satisfying some of the goals and objectives that they have about uh, and some of the issues and problems that they have. And, and so, you know, attacking it from two different perspectives is so much better than attacking it from one industry based perspective alone. So, uh, you know, and, and what I would suggest is that the, we can never have enough contacts. Right, that's what life is all about. The more contacts we make, the you know, the better we're going to be off. We're going to be in, in the future. So, my recommendation is is if you want to satisfy both sides of the coin, is to make that connection with industry and to do it at, a, at an, an incipient early level, uh, and to make sure that your the research that you're doing has relevance to those groups. And they'll tell you whether it has relevance or not because maybe you're, the question that you want to solve through your masters is a question that comes from them. And not necessarily from you and your supervisors you're sitting around the table talking about stuff. Yeah, I, I very much agree with that. Um, the the other piece that I found really helpful is to really appreciate the organization that that you're working with. Right? Is that partner a municipality? Is that partner a, a business? So that. Um, you're also clear about how they operate internally, what their goals are, what their their sort of strategic plan is, and how they operate, um, and how they're governed really helps you get a better sense of the perspective from which they're coming, right? Um, and it allows you to then build a story about your research and how it has meaning or importance for them in, in their kind of world or context, right? Um, a simple ways of thinking about communication, like for example, we're working with a municipality that operates on getting things done by quarters and their budgets are organized that way versus, you know, the university where we often demarcate time and projects by terms because often we hire a research assistant in a term or a course, um, you know, goes over a four month period. Right, so just even understanding the way they um, govern govern themselves in terms of time, um, yeah. you yeah. know, and how they plan out budgets and timing of of different projects really um, can help you better communicate, can help you better understand how you can deliver that message to them, right, on the importance of your work and or your collaboration um, together. That's can, great. I, can I just add to that? Can yes. I just add to that in saying, in saying that it's a really good point about these regions of time uh, when we talk about finances and budgets and organizational contexts is that we lay out this, this, this business plan or this organizational plan for five years. I have consistently taken students up to the, sustainable, uh, the Halliburton Sustainable Forest and they work, uh, they work on a hundred year business plan. Right, and the main motive is to return the forest back into a natural, healthy, uh, equilibrated state. Uh, they do that through adventure tourism and ecotourism, but those are secondary, right? They have to earn money, but the main mission and objective of that organization uh, exists over 100 years. And I can't think of a better sustainable model or sustainability model than a 100-year plan, right? To think of when we think about the future. Um, yeah. And so that just, uh, just sort of a continue on a continuation on what you're saying, Marilyn, about these these uh, pockets of time that we're forced to deal with. Yeah, no, it's it, you know it's something that doesn't necessarily occur to you until 
you start, you know, really collaborating with people and trying to work through different projects. And at times, I think, um, in the academy anyway, um, we have made it sound as though these things are very easy to do. And when you're in it and doing it, we now know that and appreciate that it's not easy to do. And, and um, you know, I know our students have had some of these experiences already because they've been um, involved in research at the undergrad level, like um, Shannon, for example, um, or, you know, they're, they're in it now, right? And they're getting these experiences now. And, um, yeah, I think that's one, one piece of advice that I think is important to do is really, really try to understand who you're working with, the perspective they're coming from, the constraints of the organization that they belong to, um, as well as opportunities for engagement, right? Mm. Um, so. For sure. Well, thank you very much. I really appreciate it. On behalf of the class, I just want to say a uh, warm Thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come and, and speak with us, David. We really appreciate it. Some excellent questions came out of the talk, uh, which is absolutely fantastic. And so I want to also thank the audience and the students um, for their time as well and really engaging with our speaker today.